Like the fabled goose that laid the golden egg, federally funded scientific research has yielded extraordinary yet unexpected returns. Out of odd sounding obscure beginnings have come many amazing advances that have improved each of our lives. The Golden Goose Award recognizes the people and the stories behind these unexpected and incredible scientific breakthroughs. And the whole village of Woods Hole is really oriented towards science. And we grew up as kids of scientists. I don't remember the first time I saw a horseshoe crab, but I do know that I called them limulus before I called them horseshoe crabs. <laughs> That's living in a scientific family. My father, he was very enthusiastic about science, and he was known as an educator as much as he was known as a, a researcher. I was studying platelets, and it was early in that period that Dr. Frederick Bang approached my chief and related to him the work he had done in which he demonstrated that bacteria could cause blood coagulation in the horseshoe crab and suggested that if a hematologist joined him at Woods Hole, some interesting results could be obtained. In the summer of 1963, I went to the Marine Biological Lab in Woods Hole to join Dr. Bang's laboratory. I have to emphasize that I had never seen a horseshoe crab in my life. Dr. Bang, without any additional explanation, told me to put my hand in the tank and grab a crab. Our goal was to draw comparisons between the human blood platelet and the blood cell in the horseshoe crab. But when I started to handle the blood of Limulus, it clotted very rapidly, and I was absolutely stumped and stuck. It was at that point I realized that I had a very powerful and practical mechanism for detection of bacterial endotoxin. Dad understood exactly what the importance of it was, but I don't think the general scientific community understood the importance of it for a long time. Slowly, the test became accepted to be reliable and specific for endotoxin. The impact of the limulus test and its ultimate major use in the pharmaceutical industry has been extraordinary and beyond anything I ever considered. It is the gold standard for endotoxin detection throughout the world. The ability to measure in a precise way the amount of endotoxin in things we are exposed to every day has a societal benefit that I think few people recognize. We are where we're at today in large part because of their good work. I think that my work is an excellent example of the importance of conducting and supporting basic biological research even when there's no obvious practical benefit at the time the studies are started. The history of investigative science indicates that early failure is a common feature of many discoveries which turned out to be very important. How does an animal know self, as opposed to things that are non-self, and react to all the non-self, but not react with something in our own bodies? Well, to start, let's just talk about immunity. For many years, it was believed an animal can produce an immune response to foreign material, but they'll never produce antibodies to themselves. And anything that was contrary to that was treated with a great deal of skepticism. But let me go back to the beginning. 
My boss and my mentor, Ernest Witebski, was interested in the substances that stimulate immune response, the antigens. All of us believed that autoimmunity could not occur. I made the thyroglobulin and was very disappointed to find out that it elicited antibodies. So that was a real puzzle. How could that happen? So I did it again, I got the same result. Then I had the idea, well, let's look at the thyroid gland. If in fact this is a true autoantibody, it should have some effect. It might do some damage to the thyroid gland. We showed these sections to the professor of surgery, and he looked at this and he said, oh my God, kid, you have made Hashimoto disease. We were able to get serum samples from patients with Hashimoto disease and do the experiment and show that that disease is the result of true autoimmune response, which damages the thyroid. And now we know that autoimmune diseases which we used to think of as very rare, are very, very common. The idea that there is a scientific definition that explains a condition, validates a patient, and validates their experience, and validates their need for treatment, it is truly an empowering thing. If you go back to this big bang moment for autoimmune disease, he discovered a body misfunction, if you will, that no one thought could exist. That's mind-boggling. It did take Noel's genius, but it took Dr. Wittepsi's mentorship to have him understand the value of pursuing the different course. That unbelievable combination is what's resulted in this burgeoning science and a patient community who's beginning to get its needs met. It took me only a couple of months or so to learn how to measure an electric potential across a frog skin in a laboratory in Copenhagen. That was the easy part. In 1963, cholera was killing millions of people every year. The scientific goal at that point was not so much to develop a treatment, but just to understand what the mechanism was, and to prove or disprove the prevailing theory that it had to do with poisoning of the sodium pump. It's not really a pump, but it's a biological transport mechanism in the human intestine that was able to absorb water and salts and put it back into the general circulation. Normally, the biological membrane was a frog skin. The tricky part was to adapt that system. I developed a method to use plastic tubing for a patient to swallow and to go all the way through the intestinal tract. But how did we know that we were actually getting an accurate measurement? I came across an article measuring the electric potential the same way I was trying to do. And they noticed that if they added a sugar inside the intestine, the electric potential would go way up. Oh, I saw that as a way to see if the system I had developed for the human intestine would work the same way. Well, by golly, it did. We added sugar to the solution and the electric potential went way up. At that moment, Dr. Norbert Hirschhorn walked into the lab and he said, well, that's great. If that works, it means 
that the sodium transport mechanism is working in the patient while the patient is having cholera. In other words, the sodium pump was not poisoned. And it means that we can use this for treatment. We can just have the patient drink a sugar salt solution. Let's do it. A few years later, Dr. David Nalen and Dr. Richard Cash developed a oral solution that could be administered in the rural villages of East Pakistan, and in fact, all around the world and save tens of millions of lives. But it would not have been done unless Sacker had reawakened the flame. The mythology says that there's a eureka moment, the breakthrough comes, and right away we have insulin to cure diabetes. That's not the way it happens. It isn't always a logical step from A to B to C pitfalls occur and things happen that turn everything upside down. I think the lesson here for policymakers is that just trying to understand fundamental mysteries of nature will ultimately translate into important applications. Serendipity is always there. An important part of this story, of course, is the support for this work. Public funding of scientific research is a foundational commitment of the public to the future. Science is everywhere, and we only know an infinitesimal amount. We may be able to identify the beginning, but we don't know where the end point is. The greatest obstacle to federal funding of scientific research is short-sightedness. There is no substitute for the public to be able to put that substantial amount of resources at discovering new things that don't necessarily have a direct path to some product when the research is being done. Indeed, there are many examples of those independent and freewheeling scientists finding very important observations that led to important breakthrough. But today, the environment is totally different. And it's very hard to get funding for really original, out-of-the-box research. Science is often full of serendipitous mistakes, but the real genius that those discoveries teach us is that a true scientist will not miss an opportunity to track down a mystery that may have meaning. I certainly never dreamed when we did those first experiments that it would affect medicine generally and affect human health around the world. That only happens because research takes place. 